Okay, so we're going to continue on here talking about the PN junction here. And so I'm going to draw here, and I'm going to try and keep this so that I can kind of draw things underneath it and keep the uh, x-axis the same here. So it's going to take me a second to draw this because I'm trying to be a little bit extra careful on this. And so this is like a piece of silicon, and um, basically this here, um, I'll call this side the P side that's doped with ions that are giving me holes, and then this is the N side, so it's being doped with ions that will give me uh, an N-type silicon. And so what that means here is I'm going to also kind of label this is like x equals 0 and this point right here where these two regions join this is what's actually called the metallurgical I'm not going to probably spell it correctly here metallurgical junction because that's where the P and N connect to each other. Now I'm going to draw another graph um, beneath here and um, I'm going to draw it with this metallurgical junction kind of being almost like this um, actually, instead of this being x equals 0, I don't really need an x equals 0. I'm almost going to try and draw the metallurgical junction as x equals 0. We're not going to really need an x-coordinate system to be precise in this case. So we're going to draw it like this here. Okay, so what ends up happening here? Well, we have p-type um, silicon here. So what we have here is we have some concentration of acceptor atoms that we've doped it with. And this would give me the number of free holes on the left side of this here. Um, um, I'm sorry, not N. P sub P, and I'm doing it because P sub P, and that's a little p still, um, little p sub P, that's the number of free holes, and I'm doing it sub P because it's on the P side of the silicon, and maybe actually because we called it, I think, P0, so I'll say it P sub P0, and that's equal to the acceptor um, ion concentration. And then we also will have, and it's going to be much smaller, so I'm going to just draw a dotted line here to represent that we are going to also have some minority carriers. So we do have some free electrons here, n sub p0, but they're, they're much smaller. But then we also have um, some donor concentration. And so I am putting this one up here. Um, and you might say, why am I making the donors higher than the acceptors? Um, I'm just choosing to do that. Um, I can't state that that is typically done in manufacturing processes. I just, that's, that's what the um, book is using to represent it. And so that's why I'm going to do this here for discussion purposes. Um, and so then we also would have this being equal to the number of free electrons on the N side. And then we also have, we'll have a dotted line here of um, holes on the N side. Okay, so 
these are still what we would call the minority carriers because they're the ones that are not really the dominant on each side, the dotted lines, and then the solid lines are the majority carriers. Now, when you make this metallurgical junction here, when you actually have these butted up against each other, what we need to look at here is look at the fact that right here at the x-axis, there is a very large gradient there is a large gradient in the free electrons and holes. And actually I should make that a little bit more clear here. When I say large gradient, I'll do this in green here. So this green is the large gradient on the electrons because it's going from a very high value down to a really small value. So there's this big gradient there. And then I'll, I'll just kind of highlight it here. Um, and then from here, there is a large gradient for, and I overshot it a tiny bit, for the holes um, as far as the number of free holes. So there's these large gradients here. And if remember here, um, back to the previous lesson, we had these drift and diffusion currents. Well, diffusion currents, remember, had a D and DX or dpdx in them and now we might say well wait a minute you know this is infinite slope here so you know you can't take a derivative of that it's a discontinuity well this is just representing it on a simplistic um, x-axis case i mean they're not going to be true vertical lines um, they'll, they'll be steep but they're not going to be true vertical lines like that um, with the way these devices are formed so there's going to be a very steep um, gradient here. So there's actually kind of this initial diffusion current that is quote, you know, there, but when I say it's there, it's like there for, you know, not really any length of period of time. It's really just setting up something that's going to be called um, our built-in voltage here. Um, and so what that means here, if we think and go back up to this here, is that's going to cause here, I'm trying to think, I'll, I'll do this in just blue, I'm trying to think of different colors, but we'll just do it in blue. This is going to set up, and it's not necessarily symmetrical, even though I'm almost drawing it symmetrical. I guess it's a little off symmetrical, um, where we're going to have negative charge here, essentially, and positive here. And the idea is, is that the electrons here are kind of flowing because we have a, a large concentration of electrons in here. So some of them are going to flow over into this region over here. And so we're going to have some excess electrons here, just like we're going to have some of these um, holes kind of flow over here and so we're going to get this excess of holes here and then this region that's set up here this region right here is called the depletion region and that depletion region There are very few, essentially none, Z. 
zero mobile electrons or holes. And one way you can kind of think of why there would be very few is these electrons that are kind of coming over here. Well, remember this is p-type, so we're getting more electrons coming over here. So you can almost think of it as like, well, they're bonding into those hole areas. And the same thing here, the holes that are moving here are bonding into the electron areas. And so there's not really any free electrons or holes because they're getting paired up with the charge that's moving across here because of this gradients and this initial diffusion current that gets set up. And when I say initial, this is not something like you can, again, hook a diode up and there's a, a diffusion current set up. This is something that just very quickly happens in manufacturing process um, and not anything that you could actually measure um, or uh, observe. But what this does give me here is I'm going to bring down here another set of axes. Now, this one is going to be measuring the potential. And you want to think of this as kind of voltage. Now, when I say voltage, it's not really a voltage that you can measure. It's just a potential barrier that's been created here. And the potential barrier that's been created here is I'm going to bring down these depletion region lines here. And basically what we end up having here is that we have essentially, we're gonna put the zero here. Now, when we say zero potential, that doesn't necessarily mean earth ground zero. That means, you know, we, we have some reference that we're always measuring this against. And so the reference, I'm just choosing that to be zero. Um, and then what ends up happening is we get this potential then that builds up and Uh, can't draw right now. Oh, I don't want to select. I want to erase that. And I want to draw a curve. There we go. Somewhat. And so there's this potential that gets um, set up. And again, that's because of these positive and negative charged atoms here. So we're getting a difference in potential in these two regions now. And when we say a difference in potential, um, this is like an internal, again, you can't hook up a voltmeter and measure a voltage. It's like an internal barrier that exists. Um, and the idea being an internal barrier that exists, one way to think about it is that, you know, um, if you just think about a chip here, like, you know, if you put like 0.1 volts onto a chip that doesn't necessarily turn the chip on you might have to apply more voltage to the chip to actually get it turned on because inside there you know you need a certain amount of voltage in order for the circuit to work and you know that's because these devices you know have these kinds of um, what are called built-in potentials um, that you have to exceed a certain voltage in order for these transistors and diodes and other things to start working and so that's what this is really getting here. So what we call this here, this is the built-in voltage, VBI. Um, and this is what we call the built-in potential barrier. I could spell, that's still probably not right. Uh, for some reason I can't spell barrier right now because it's Friday when I'm making this barrier. All right. 
Now, there is a formula. We're not going to derive this, but I tried to draw here. This is actually an exponential type of curve that's going on here. Um, it, it's not necessarily really drawn like, so we kind of have an exponential growth here, and then it has an inflection point, which kind of turns into a logarithmic um, growth after a certain point. You know, so so it, it, it's um, not necessarily well drawn that way, but it kind of will give you some idea on where this formula may come from. So we have a formula for the built-in voltage. Now I'm going to write the formula down that's in the text. Um, and there's a problem with this formula based off of um, what they have given us here um, as far as values in the book. And I'll, I'll reference here. They call this KT over E, the natural log of NA nd over ni squared and v this this quantity right here this has actually got a name for it we call vt i'm sorry not vt well that's what we actually call it vt we give it a name vt which is kt over E. We call this the thermal voltage. And this is equal to, this is a good number to remember or put down in your notes, 0 0.026 um, at T equals 300 Kelvin. And so let me highlight some equations again. So this is an important equation. This equation is important. This equation is important. But we have a mistake here. Not we Actually, we don't have a mistake. The book has a mistake, I should say. Um, and the mistake here is that K is still Boltzmann's constant. And I'm flipping back in my notes right here. And if you look back in your notes, um, I gave you the value of K being... 86 times 10 to the minus 6 electron volts per Kelvin. 100% correct. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think it's C here um, for coulombs per Kelvin in this formula, because you're dividing by 1.6. This is, you know, the charge of an electron. 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th. Which, if you use that formula as is, and you use the value of k that we were given, you are not going to get a single correct answer at all. It's going to look completely wrong all the time. And that's because the value here we've already been given for K is an electron volts per Kelvin. So really, our formula that we should use for this course, if we're using this value for K, the formulas that we should use is simply just KT natural log of NA ND over NI squared. And that our thermal voltage is KT. So I'm going to highlight those. Now you might say, wait, you got two different equations and they're different. But again, they're not different. Let me show you here. Um, let me go here and just look up Boltzmann's constant. Okay, 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd meter squared kilograms, seconds to the minus 2, Kelvin to the minus 1. So, if I look at that 1.38064852, and then I do exponent 23 negative, and divide that by 1. 
exponent 19 negative look we get 1 2 3 4 5 6 86 actually we get 86.3 you know so whoops that's not what I want we get actually 86.3 times 10 to the negative 6 so again what we have here is that this value is actually the one that most textbooks put in for Boltzmann's constant actually but all we've done is we've divided by the charge of an electron and because we've divided by the charge of the electron that puts it in electron volts per Kelvin um, or in essentially volts per Kelvin and so we don't have to do that again and so for this course and again um, that's a mistake in your text so for this one we definitely want to use these values here so let's look at a quick example here of this so if I do a quick example um, let's do the built-in voltage for gallium arsenide at T equals 300 Kelvin NA is equal to 10 to the 16th centimeters to the minus 3 and D is equal 10 to the 17th centimeters to the minus 3 and we're supposed to compute what VBI is and well first off we need to know what the intrinsic concentration of gallium arsenide is which I computed that previously so the intrinsic concentration of gallium arsenide is 1.8 times 10 to the sixth centimeters to the minus three. Oh, as a side note here I find a lot of people making mistakes with numbers when they're written like this this is equal to 1 times 10 to the 16th and 1 times 10 to the 17th which to me seems pretty obvious and simple but for some reason I occasionally see people writing 10 times 10 to the 16th and 10 times 10 to the 17th which is 100% wrong so if you have 10 to the 6 that's just 1 times 10 to the 16th or you can literally just type 10 to the 16th power in your calculator you can literally just do 10 carat you know 16 you know I'll put it in parentheses I don't know if you need to put it in parentheses on your calculator or not um, so I mean you can literally do that too um, but you know don't for some reason I've seen people do 10 times 10 to the 16th which not not correct don't do that all right so to finish this example here we simply have our VBI well we're at T equals 300 Kelvin so we know that this VT is simply just 0 0.026 and then we're going to times the natural log of NA ND over NI squared And actually, I should point out here, maybe I should write that, you know, the whole point here is, is that I didn't actually do the substitution here, but you can see that you can literally just substitute VT in place of that KT there in the equation. So that's why I got the 0.026, which this is then equal to 0.026 natural log of 1 times 10 to the 16th times 1 times 10 to the 17th divided by quantity 1.6 I'm sorry no. one point eight times 10 to the sixth quantity squared and that this then is equal to 
1.23 volts when you go through the computation. All right, so I am going to make one more video here, but I actually have to, or maybe two more, we'll see, but I actually have to go to a meeting here. So I'm going to stop this video and um, I'll make another video here um, when I go to the meeting, after I finish the meeting.